In today's lesson, we will continue to cover on the topic on programmable logic controllers or we call them the PLCs. We will teach you how to program the PLCs and how to use them for your application. So as we know, in a control chain, we have these four elements here. Okay, so we have the input element, which is the eyes and ears of the system, the signal processing element, which is the brain of the system, the final control element, and finally the output element. So in today's lesson, we are going to teach you how to use the PLC as the signal processing element, which is the brain of the system. So we know that in earlier topics, we have learned about control relay and timer relays, and we have learned how to use them to control a particular application. And as we know, if the application gets more and more complicated, you will need a lot of wiring so the PLC is here to reduce the amount of wirings needed. So we will actually program the PLC such that you can control the system for your particular application needs. Now let's take a look at the next example. Okay, so in this example one, we can see that this is the automatic door control system of an office. Okay, A process controller controls the system. So this statement tells me that the process controller is the brain of the system. So when the 1PB push button is actuated, the cylinder will extend to open the door. A sensor S1 is used to monitor the departure of the personnel at the door. When S1 is on, the door has to remain open as the personnel may not have cleared the envelope of the door. So 3 seconds after sensor S1 turns off, which means that the person should have by then cleared the envelope of the door, the door will then close automatically. Right in the spaces provided, the various components that make up the control chain for the control of this automatic door system. So we are supposed to fill in the blanks for this control chain. So let's take a look at what are the input elements of this control system first. So let's take a look at this. So I can see that the 1PB push button is definitely the input element and the sensor S1 is also the input element of the system. Okay. So let's fill in the blanks first. So 1PB and S1 are the input elements of this system. So now we are going to find what is the signal processing element, which is the brain of the system. Well, from this statement over here, a process controller controls the system. I know that the process controller is the brain of the system. So let's fill in the blanks. So the process controller is the signal processing element. And now we shall take a look at what is the final control element. So looking at this example, I know that I have to control the cylinder, where cylinder is the output element. So let's take a look at the pneumatic drive circuit over here. In order to control whether the cylinder extends or retract, okay, the directional control valve is being used. And I can see from this diagram over here that a 5-2-way normally open single solenoid directional control valve is being used to control the cylinder. Okay whether to extend or retract. So, I will write here, the directional control valve, in short, is the final control element. So with this, we have already completed this control chain. Now, we shall take a look at the next page. Where we will learn about the PLCs and how to use them in the control chain. As we have learned in PLC chapter 1, the PLC model we are going to use for our lab is the Omron NJ101 series. So later on, we will teach you the programming instructions based on this model of the PLC, which is also of the industry standard IEC 61131-3. Earlier, you have also learned that 
the Omron NJ101PLC has the power supply, the CPU, the input card and the output card. So the input card is where you connect all the input elements to it such as sensors and switches and the output card is where you connect all the final control elements or even the output elements to the card. Now let's take a look at the schematic diagram of the PLC in figure 4B over here. So you can see that in this figure, we connect all the input elements to the input card of the PLC and we connect all the output elements and the final control elements to the output card of the PLC. So for this particular PLC model, the input card that we are using has 16 channels. Okay, so you can actually connect up to 16 input devices to the PLC and also 16 output elements and final control elements to the PLC. You can also expand your PLC capability by increasing the number of input card and output card on the PLC so that it can support even more input elements and output elements. However, for our lab, we will only have one input card and one output card, which means that I can only support up to 16 input elements and 16 output elements slash final control elements in the system. So you can see that for the PLC, we will actually write our program using our own personal laptop or computer and then we will transfer in the program to the CPU of the PLC. So in PLC, there are many different types of languages. The language we are going to teach you in this model of the PLC is ladder diagram. So this is a typical programming language in ladder which we will later on teach you the basic instruction sets that can be used for this ladder programming logic. So now let's take a look at the hardware configuration for the PLC first. Programmable controllers are microprocessor based device specially designed to replace the relays and hardware logic. We know that for complicated applications, you will need a lot of wirings for the relays. Hence, we will use the PLC to reduce the number of wirings required. In figure 5, we can see this is a programmable controller system. Okay, so this is the PLC. So what is inside this PLC? First, we will write a program using our laptop or computer and transfer the program to the CPU of the PLC. So the CPU has two memory areas. One is called component data memory. One is called program memory. So we will write here first, program memory and component data memory. We also know that in a PLC, there will definitely be power supply because you need power supply to supply power to the CPU. And also power supply to supply power to the input output card. So what do we connect to the input output card? We will connect the input elements to the input card and we will connect the final control element or the output elements to the output card. So this is the block diagram for the PLC. Now we will take a look at the various type of communication from the PC to the PLC. So for this Omron PLC, we will install the software called SysMac Studio onto our laptops. Okay. And then you will transfer the program. Okay. That you have typed from your PC to the PLC using the internet communication or using the USB communication. These two communication protocol is being supported in our labs. However, the default we are using for our lab is Ethernet communication.
Now we'll take a look at the next page whereby we will tell you what is the model of the input output card we are going to use for Omron NJ101 PLC. So as you can see, we are using the ID211 input card for our PLC and we are using the OC211 output card for our PLC. The output card we are using in our lab is of a relay type. Okay, so it can support DC 24 volts output elements or final control elements. Now let's take a look at this page over here where we will illustrate to you the internal register and the data type for this model of the PLC. You can see from this table over here, there are many data types available. So we will only focus on a few data types in our ladder programming. First, we will take a look at the Boolean data type, which we will use extensively. Boolean data type have the value of 0 or 1, so it's either false or true. We will also take a look at integer data types, where the value range from negative 32768 to 32768. And finally, we will take a look at the time data types Okay, for the software timers we are going to use for the PLC ladder programming. So these are the different type of variables that we will be using in our PLC application. So what are variables? Variables are symbolic names for input, output and memory areas within the PLC. So we have the local variable, which are variables that can be only used within the program. The global variables or the external variables, which are variables associated with real-world devices that are connected to the PLC input-output module. So what are the real-world devices? They are the solenoids, the buzzers, the sensors, the switches, okay? That is being connected to the input-output card of the PLC. There is also a type of variable called the constant variable, which are values that is constant or identical throughout the entire program and the PLC cannot change it. So example 2 shows you the different type of internal variable and the global variables. So as I told you earlier, variable are just symbolic names. So all these are the names of the variables and of their respective data types. So you can see for the global variable, okay, we try to name it according to the devices that we connect. So for instance, if it's a push button, we'll call it auto underscore PB, okay, so that we know that that is a push button. If it's a limit switch, we'll call it LS1, LS2, okay. Now, we will take a look at the programming language for ladder diagrams. Ladder diagrams is one of the most commonly used programming language for PLCs. Now, we are going to teach you the basic symbols that we can use for the ladder diagrams. Okay, First is the coil representation, whereby all the final control elements and output elements, we will represent them by a coil, okay? just like what I have illustrated here. So for final control elements and output elements, you can actually draw them using the coil. As for contact representation, okay, we will use them for input elements, okay, input elements such as limit switch, push button, sensors, we will just purely use the normally open or normally closed contact. So this is different from what you have learned previously in electro pneumatic, whereby you have draw the limit switch to be either normally open or normally open held closed, okay, depending on the circuit logic so we will not be drawing this okay this will not be drawn in the plc ladder diagram instead we will be using this symbol normally open or normally closed for input elements and a coil for final control and output elements let's take a look at this end logic here you can see that in order for this light bulb to turn on pb3 and PB2 must be on, okay, so that the contact will close, then the light bulb will be on. Let's take a look at the all logic over here, where you can see that in order for a light bulb to be on, either PB3 or PB2 
can be on to turn on the light bulb. And we shall take a look at the latching logic over here, whereby you can see that if I am using a internal relay, okay, this is an internal software relay of the PLC, so I call it R20. So in order for this latching circuit to work first, I need to press auto PB, R20 will turn on, the contact will close, okay, so this will provide the latching logic, so that when auto PB is being pressed, R20 will be on, and when it's on, the contact will close, the light bulb will be on. And it will stay on because of this latching logic. Only when you press the stop button over here, normally close will become open, and R20 will be off, the light bulb will then go off. So this is the same latching logic we have taught you earlier in the electrical hardwired diagrams. And... You can see over here, we do not allow duplicate output coil. For instance, this is what we call a duplicate output coil. You can see that in this rung, there's a light bulb. In this rung, again, same light bulb. So the same output coil, light bulb one, cannot occur more than once. Okay, it must only occur once. So how do we combine these two rungs together? We can actually use this design. Okay, so for instance, when limit switch 1 and the sensor is on, you want the light bulb to turn on, okay? And you also want, if limit switch 2 is on, the light bulb will turn on. So you can actually use a all logic over here, where you can see that when the limit switch 1 is on and the sensor is on, the light bulb will turn on, okay? Same thing for limit switch 2. As long as limit switch 2 is on, the light bulb will be on. So this is the correct ladder logic you should be using. So I repeat myself again, you are not allowed to use the same output coil more than once. This logic also applies to electrical ladder diagram where we will never use the same output coil more than once. Okay. However, for contacts, okay, this is what we call contacts, okay, normally open contacts or normally close contact, you can use as many times as you want. Let's take a look at the next page. We are now going to introduce two functions that are commonly used for PLC ladder diagrams. The first function is actually the time delay function, which we call the T on timer. Okay, so this timer is very similar to the timer you have learned earlier in electrical pneumatic chapters. Earlier in the electrical pneumatic chapters, you have learned about time delay control relay. So for those time delay control relay, you can actually set the preset timing, okay? However, if you have a lot of timers that is being required in your application, you will also need a lot of time delay control relays. You will need the physical hardware. However, for PLC, you do not need all these time control relay anymore. You can just use the inbuilt software timers in the PLC itself and use them. So for instance, in this example over here, I have a timer of one second, okay? And this is a software timer, which means that I do not need any physical hardware of the time delay control relay. I just need to call this function available in the PLC programming language and use them. So in this way, it saves a lot of wiring. And of course, the cost of buying so many time delay control relay. So for this time delay function over here, you can see that there are four operands to it, okay? So the first one is the input. So input means when do you want to start the timer? So in this example over here, you can see that I connected a sensor to the input of the timer. So that means that when the sensor is on, the timer will start. Another operand of this timer is the PT, which we call it the preset time. So what is the timing for this timer? I want to set it as one second in this example. So I will type T hashtag one S, okay? Which means that this timer is a one second timer. Next, I will have this signal output. So how do you know that the timing of one second is up? Well, the Q will actually inform you that the timing has reached. 
So when we are using the time delay function, normally we also have the time delay context. Okay, so we will call them tr one dot q. Okay, we can use it as normally open or normally closed depending on the logic. So what this means is when the sensor is on, one second later, the time is up. If you are using a normally open contact of the timer tr one. What happens is this contact will close to tell you that hey, timing has reached. Or if you are using a normally closed contact, it will also open okay, when the time has reached one second. So why TR1.Q? Why is it of this name? Okay, well, first, this is the name of the timer TR1. So if your timer is called TR2, you will also call this TR2, okay? So in this context, in this example, TR1 is the name of the timer, Q is the output. So by using the name TR1.Q means that if the time has reached its preset time, and in this example is one second, this contact will close, okay? And this contact, if you're using a normally close, it will become open. So later on, we will show you how to use the timer. And lastly, we have this thing called the elapsed time. Elapsed time is displaying the current time value. The next function which is commonly used is the count up counter. Okay, which we call it the CTU up counter. So let's take a look at this example over here, whereby it has five operands to this function here you can see that for the first operand which is the cu okay it means it is an input to start the counter okay so i need you to make a change here in the notes this is a counter not a timer so when the sensor turns on okay the counter will count once so whenever the sensor turns on again the counter will count the second time Okay, so for instance, if I draw a timing diagram for you to visualize, okay, this is the sensor logic, okay. Okay. So imagine this is the sensor logic, it turns off and on, okay. So how many times will the counter count? The counter will count four times, okay, because the sensor actually turned on four times. So the counter will count four times. What is the preset count of this counter? Okay, so the preset value of this counter is 10. In other words, it must reach the count of 10. Then the counter will know that Q will turn on. Okay, so Q will turn on if the count value is reached. So for instance, if my sensor turn on 10 times, this count value is reached. And how do we know? Okay, in the PRC ladder diagram. Again, we can draw this. Normally open and normally close contact. And we will name it after the counter itself. So you can see the name of this counter is called CTR1. Okay, and the counter output is called Q. Okay, similar to the timer. So we call it dot Q. Okay, same thing for this. So... When the counter has reached the preset value of 10, what happens to this contact? It will close, okay? And this one will open. So we can actually make use of this to do our ladder programming later on. Okay, so this part here, we will elaborate more later on. But you must know that whenever you use a counter, you definitely need to use its context as well. So that you know that the count value has reached. So how do you reset this counter? We have this reset input over here, whereby whenever the reset button is pressed, the counter will be reset back to zero. So for instance, if the sensor has already count four times and you decided that, okay, it's a miscount, I need to reset everything, you can just press your reset button, which you have written over here, okay? The counter will just reset automatically back to zero. And what is CV? CV is to display the current value of the counter. 
okay so for instance if your sensor currently has only turned on three times your display count will be three because that is the current value of your counter with this let's go on to the next example which we will teach you how to apply what we have learned earlier and into this question in example 3 we can see that there is a PLC controlled buzzer system in figure 6 over here so this is the PLC controlled buzzer system whereby on PB and off PB is connected to the input card of the PLC and the buzzer is connected to the output card of the PLC so whenever the on PB is pressed the buzzer will be on the buzzer will be off when the off PB is pressed we are supposed to design a PLC program in ladder diagram okay to implement this control so before we do that in the PLC we need to actually declare the global variables for all these input output devices okay which means the on button off button and the buzzer so what do we connect to channel 1 in 0, 0 of the input card we have connected a push button so I call it the on PB you can also call it another name if you like but in our example we already name it on PB you can see that we also connected the off PB okay which we call it off PB to the in drill one so I will declare this in my PLC program that off PB is being connected to in drill one and finally we have the buzzer which we call BZ connected to the output card out drill drill so I'll call it BZ okay which stands for buzzer so now I'm supposed to write the PLC program in ladder okay earlier on we have learned that for buttons or input elements such as button sensors limit switches we will only draw normally open or normally close contact for the input as for output we will draw the coil okay so let's try and draw this PLC program so PLC program um, differs slightly from your electrical hardware diagram first I do not need to draw these two lines I'll need to draw the single line on the left and secondly the relays I'm going to use in my PLC logic okay is actually software relays not the physical control relay which we are going to use in electrical hardware diagram so we will design in software control relays okay and we call them R1 okay you can call them R2 R3 is just a name R for me stands for relay and once means number one okay relay one so I will design in first a control relay called R1 and it's a software relay and the purpose is to turn on and off the buzzer so who control this control relay R1 well first I will draw a latching circuit because I know that I'm going to press the button only momentarily okay so whenever I press the on PB R1 will turn on and it will turn on the buzzer okay so I will draw the on PB over here on the left just above the latching circuit and on PB I will draw it normally open so that when you press it becomes closed and R1 turns on so when do we want to turn off the buzzer as the question mentioned they say that you press the off PB then the buzzer will turn off so I will say that the stop condition is actually the off PB so I will draw the stop condition outside the latch which means I will draw it in this area over here so the off PB I will draw normally close so that when you press it becomes open okay so let's see this logic again when you press on PB R1 will turn on and this latching will allow power to go to R1 and power it continuously so if I draw a contact of R1 okay and tie it to the buzzer what this means is when I press on PB R1 will just turn on and it stays on hence the buzzer will keep buzzing it will be off only when you press the off PB 
because when you press the off PV, normally close becomes open. R1 will be off, the contact will become open again, and the buzzer will be off. So this is how this PLC program is going to work. So let's revise again. For input elements for a PLC program in ladder, we will draw either as normally open or normally closed contacts. For output or final control element, we will draw a coil okay, to represent it in PLC program. And in PLC program, we do not use physical control relay. We will use software relay like what I'm doing here. We call the relay R1. It's just a software relay inside the PLC program. With this, let's take a look at the simulation circuit to see how I can simulate this on the PLC Sysmax Studio software. I'm now going to show you the software I'll be using to program this NJ101 series PLC. The software is called Sysmax Studio. So earlier, I already configured my PLC under the CPU expansion rack. So you can see that on the left here is the power supply unit. Okay. And in the center here is the NJ101 series PLC. This is the input card ID211. And this is the output card. OC211 of relay type. Now let's take a look at the I.O. map where I will declare my external devices over here. You can see that the on PB and the off PB has been declared in this I.O. map to be connected to bit 00 and bit 01 of the input card. The same goes for the buzzer whereby it's being connected to the bit 00 of the output card. Now let's take a look at the program itself. So this is the program we have designed earlier in our worksheet. You can see that R1 is an internal relay, okay, whereby R1, when we design it, the purpose is to control the buzzer. So it's just a software relay in the PLC. As for the external variables, it is on PB, off PB and the buzzer, which we have declared earlier in the IO map. Okay, and you can realize that all of them here are of boolean type, which means that they either turn on or off. Okay, there are only two logics to this type of data type. So now let's try to run the simulation mode. So when I run simulation mode, it means that I do not have the physical device with me now. I'm just purely running software simulation. So I do not have a physical on button with me or even the CPLC unit. So I'm just going to toggle okay, the context of the on PB to show you what happens. So first, when on PB has been pressed, okay, R1 will turn on. And even though if you let go of on PB, okay, R1 stays on because of this latch. Okay, and the buzzer stays on. So if you press off PB, okay, R1 is off, the buzzer is off. And even if your finger left off PB, okay, R1 is still off because the circuit has been broken previously. So let's watch this again. When I turn on on PB momentarily, the buzzer is on. Okay, and it stays on because R1 latch is here. And it will keep powering R1 until I press off PB. Okay, where I'm going to actuate momentarily means I'm going to turn on and off. Okay, and you can see that R1 is off and the buzzer stays off. So to summarize, the purpose of this circuit is when I press on PB, the buzzer is on, okay, and it stays on until you press off PB. So now I'm going to stop the simulation. So this is how our circuit design works in this PLC program. And Let's go back to the worksheet now to look at the next example. We are now back to the worksheet and we will take a look at example 4. So in example 4, we have this PLC controlled buzzer system and it's operated in such a way whereby whenever the on PB is pressed, the buzzer will turn on and the buzzer will turn off whenever a 5 second time delay expires or when the off PB is being pressed. 
So this example is very similar to the previous example, except that this time round, we have a 5 second delay timer. So first, let's take a look at the declaration of the I.O. devices, which is the input-output devices. First of all, we can see that we connected the on-PB to 0, 0 and the off-PB to 0, 1 of the input card. We connected the buzzer to the output card out 0, 0. So let's declare all these variables inside here first. So it's on-PB, off-PB, and the buzzer. Okay, so we are supposed to develop this program in PLC ladder. First of all, I will draw the line over here and I will want to design first a control relay. So the purpose of the control relay is to turn on and off the buzzer. So I will draw a control relay. Okay, it's a software relay as I mentioned earlier and I can call it R1. Okay, you can call it any other names you like, but for me, I like to call R1, R2, R3, R4 in a standard way because R stands for relay. Okay, so I will draw the latching circuit as well because I know that whenever I press the push button momentarily, I need the latching circuit to keep powering on the coil of the control relay. So the purpose of R1 is to turn on the buzzer, okay? So I'll write down the purpose. So according to the question, I need to press the on PB to turn on the buzzer. So I will put the on PB over here just above the latch because when you press the on PB, R1 will turn on and the latch will continue to power on the R1. So I will draw a normally open on PB. Okay, so that when you press, it will become closed and R1 will turn on. And what are the conditions to turn off the buzzer? As the question mentioned, it says that when the 5 second delay has expired or the off PB is being pressed. Okay, so let me draw the timer first. Okay, so I know that I need a timer and the timer is a T on timer. I will call this timer TR1. Okay. You can also call it TR2, TR3, TR4. Okay. So it's up to you. So inside this timer, there is four operands in preset time, queue and elapsed time. Okay. All these you have learned earlier. So when do you want to start this timer? I want to start the timer when I press the on PB. So I will actually use R1, okay, to start the timer. Why? Because when you press on PB, R1 will turn on. Okay, so the timer will just start. You cannot put the on PB at timer here. Why? Because if you press and let go, okay, in other words, you will not start your timer at all because you are not going to permanently press your finger at the on push button forever, right? So when you press on PB, R1 will turn on and it will stay on. So it is advisable to put R1 to start the timer instead. Okay, and the question says that the timer is of 5 second delay. So I will write here T hashtag 5S because the syntax for this preset time is always t hashtag and the number of seconds. So I'll write here t hashtag 5s. And for the elapsed time, I give it a name so that when I run the software, I can actually see what is the current time. Okay, so you can call it any name you like. For me, I like to call it the standard name tr1 display. You can also put your own name. And for the Q, okay, Q means the output of this timer. So when 5 seconds is up, okay, I want to turn off the buzzer. And remember earlier, I told you that to use the timer, normally we have the function of the timer and the context of the timer. So I will actually put the context of this timer over here as the stop condition, okay, for this R1 relay because 
you can see that when five second is up okay what happened to this contact it will become open okay and why do i name it tr1.q okay well because first this contact belongs to this timer that's why it's called tr1 and dot q means the output of this timer so when five second is up the contact will change the output will change so if you draw normally close it becomes open and it will cut off the power to r1 hence the buzzer will turn off okay another off condition according to the question okay if you read is also the off pb okay so when the off pb is pressed the buzzer needs to be off so i will also draw the off pb over here okay and you can see that when the off pb is being pressed the contact will open and the buzzer will be off and finally please remember to draw R1 controlling the buzzer. So this is the PLC program in ladder for this application. Now let's take a look at the simulation circuit in Omron Sysmax Studio. I'm now showing you the example for program on the Omron Sysmax Studio. So this is the program we have designed earlier in the worksheet and you can see that R1, TR1 and TR1 display is an internal variable. So R1, the purpose is to control the buzzer and it's a software relay. It is of Boolean type which means that it either turns on or off. TR1 is a T on timer. Okay, it's a software timer that we are using. So you can see that TR1 has been declared as a on delay timer and is a function that is available in this PLC. TR1 display is a time data type. Okay, it will display the current time of this timer. And for the external variable, it's still the on, off, and the buzzer. So now let's try and run the simulation mode. So when I run simulation mode, it means that I do not have any physical hardware with me, including the PLC. So I'm just using software simulation. And hence, I will just toggle the context of the on PB and the off PB later on to show you, as I do not have the physical hardware with me. So you can see that when I press on PB later on momentarily, R1 will turn on and it will turn on the timer as well. And it will also turn on the buzzer. So when time has reached 5 seconds later on, okay, the contact of TR1 will change. So since I draw normally close, it will become open and R1 will be off. In other words, when I press on PB, buzzer will turn on. 5 seconds later, the buzzer will turn off because the 5 seconds timer contact is here and it will cut off the power to R1 and hence the buzzer is off. So let's watch this now okay so i'll toggle the on pb momentarily you can see the timer now has started okay five seconds later it opens and r1 is off the buzzer is off okay you couldn't really watch this contact changing because it's very fast okay but you can see that r1 will turns off so let's watch this again okay on pb turns on momentarily Okay, you can see that R1 will be off the moment it reach 5 seconds because this contact opens and close back immediately. So that's why you can't really see it changing. So another off condition in this program is the off PB. You can see that even though I turn on and off on PB momentarily, if I turn on, on PB, off PB, the circuit will still break, okay? even though I do not need to wait till it reach 5 seconds later to cut off the buzzer. So let's watch this again. When I turn on on PB, okay, and I turn on off PB before it reach 5 seconds, R1 will go off as well. So the off PB and the timer are the two off condition, or I call them the stop condition for the buzzer control. So to turn on the buzzer, you just need to activate on PB and to turn off the buzzer 
there are two conditions, either or. Either you press the off PB or wait for five seconds later. So let's watch this again. When I turn on on PB, okay, buzzer turns on five seconds later. Let's watch. The buzzer is off, okay. And when I turn on on PB, okay. And I turn on off PB before the five seconds timer. You can see that the buzzer will also goes off, okay. If I activate the off PB. So this is how this circuit works, okay, or this program works. Now we shall go back to the worksheet. We are now back to the worksheet looking at example 5 now where figure 8a shows an automatic pill filling station. So this is the station. When a bottle is loaded manually and a start push button is pressed, the hopper door will open by energizing continuously the solenoid to fill out 100 pills into the bottle. So you can see that when you press the start PB, the solenoid will be energized and the door will be open so that you can fill 100 pills into the bottle. So each pill is detected by a sensor, PS1, as it drops into the bottle. Upon reaching the required number of count, the solenoid will de-energize, that means it turns off, okay, and the hopper door will close. The counter will only reset when the reset push button is pressed after the preset count is reached. So you can see from figure 8b, this is the wiring diagram at the PLC input and output module card. We are supposed to design a PLC program in ladder logic to implement this control. So before we write the PLC program, first we have to declare the variables okay, for the input-output devices, okay, which is what we call the I.O. devices. So as you can see in this wiring diagram over here, we already named all my buttons and sensors and even the solenoids. So this diagram must tally with this declaration so that you will not confuse the user. So let's take a look. So for input card, in zero zero, we call it PB1. Okay, because we already connected a push button one to the input card. In zero one will be PS1. In zero two will be PB2. As for out zero zero, we are connecting the solenoid SOL1. Now, let's take a look at how we are going to develop this PLC program in ladder. First, let's draw this line over here. And let's take a look at the question again first. You can see that um, the action in this pill filling station is actually the hopper door. We are actually turning on the solenoid to open the door of the hopper and we will turn off the solenoid to close the hopper door okay so basically this is how we fill up the pills into the bottle so i would summarize in such a way whereby whenever the push button pb1 is being pressed okay the solenoid will be energized okay i will say that solenoid one will be on then the pill filling station will start to fill the pills into the bottle However, where will it stop? It will stop when the count has reached 100 pieces. Okay, so first, knowing that I need to control the hopper door, which is actually controlling the solenoid, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to design a control relay and the purpose is to turn on and off this solenoid so that the door will open or close. Let's take a look at how I'm going to draw this first. So I will design a relay, okay, a software relay, I call it R1. And the purpose is to turn on and off the solenoid, which is the hopper door, okay? Because the solenoid is controlling the hopper door. Okay, and again, I will always have a latching circuit because we are using push buttons over here. And you know that we are not going to continuously energize a push button. We will normally momentarily actuate a push button. So that's why we need a latching circuit. So when will you turn on the solenoid? Okay. 
I will turn on when I press PB1. So I'll put PB1 on top of the latch. Okay. And when do you want to turn off the hopper door? The question says that when it has reached the count of 100. Okay. When you hear the word count, it means that I need to have a counter. Or else, how am I going to count the number of pills falling into this bottle? So, before I do anything, let's draw the counter first. So, I'll change the color of my pen to black, okay? So that you can visualize better. So, I'll call this counter CTR1 and it's a count up counter. There are five operands in this counter, namely C U R preset value Q and CV okay ask yourself who triggers the counter okay let's take a look at the question first you can see that each pill is detected by a PS1 as it drops into the bottle so I will say PS1 is the one that will trigger the counter okay so for instance if one pill drops into the bottle sensor will turn on once and the counter will also count up once so i will draw the sensor okay which i also draw as a normally open contact over here because this is plc programming input elements are being represented by normally open or normally closed contacts i draw normally open because when the sensor sends it will close so I'll write over here PS1 and I also want to draw another contact. This contact I will want to use R1. Why? Because I only want to start counting when I press the push button. So when I press PB1, R1 will turn on, R1 contact will close. That's where I also want the counter to start counting. Okay, but the counter will not count until the sensor sense there's a pill going into the bottle. So these are the two conditions, okay? And it's an end condition to trigger the counter, which I'll connect to the CU of the counter, which is the input to the counter. And what is the preset value of this counter? The preset value of this counter is 100 because the question says that I need to count up to 100 pills. What do you want to name the current value of this counter? I will call it a name, okay? So I will use a standard name. I will call it CTR1 display. Again, you can put any names you like, okay? Even your own name. So what this CV operand does is it will show you the current value count of this counter, okay? So if your sensor has already sensed three pills going into this bottle, your, car, your CTR1 display will show a count value of 3 in your PLC program. Lastly, you can see that there's a Q over here in the counter. Q means the output of this counter. Okay, so when you reach the count of 100, how do I know? Well, you can know by drawing the contact of this counter. So I'll draw a normally closed contact over here. I call it CTR1 because the name of this counter is CTR1 and this contact belongs to this counter and the output of this counter is dot Q. Okay, so this is how I use the counter. So when you reach the count of 100, what happens to R1? R1 will go off because when you reach the count of 100, normally closed will become open and you will turn off R1, which is controlling the solenoid. So you are turning off the solenoid. Hence, the door will just close. Next, let's take a look at the question again. The question says that the counter will only reset when the preset reset push button PB2 is pressed after the preset count is reached. So in other words, I can only reset this counter when the preset count is reached and when you press PB2. 
So now I will design in a relay. I call it R2. The purpose, okay, is to reset the counter CTR1. Okay, so according to a question, in order to reset this counter, first the count value is reached. How do you know the count value has reached 100? Well, again, we make use of the counter Q, okay, which is the context of this counter. We will use normally open so that when the preset count is reached, okay, normally open will become closed. It will change, okay. And another condition to reset the counter is by pressing the reset button PB2. So these are the two conditions for us to reset the counter. So let's take a look again. I'm using a CTR1.Q contact normally open because CTR1.Q belongs to this counter. Okay, CTR1 and .Q is the output of this counter. So by using the name CTR1.Q normally open contact, what happens is when the count value has reached 100, the output will change. In other words, if I draw normally open, it will become closed. And if I press the PB2, PB2 contact will become closed as well. And R2 will be energized. So when R2 is energized, I will use it to reset the counter. So I will write here R2 over here and link it to the reset of the counter. So this is how I reset the counter. The software does not allow you to draw normally open contacts or normally closed contact at the reset of the counter. Hence, we must use this technique to reset the counter. Lastly, I haven't drawn in the solenoid, but this one is very easy for us. I know that I need to open and close the hopper door using a solenoid and the control relay that's controlling this solenoid is actually R1 which I have already indicated earlier on over here. So when R1 is on, the contact will be closed and solenoid will be on. Hence the door will open or close depending on whether your PB1 is being pressed or your count value has reached 100. Now, let's take a look at the Omron simulation circuit, but because of the simulation purposes, we will not use 100 because I don't want to trigger the counter by 100 times manually. I will just use a preset count of 5 for this simulation purpose. So let's take a look at the Omron Sysmax Studio simulation. We are now at Sysmax Studio looking at example 5 over here. And you can see this is the program for example 5. PB1, PS1, PB2, Solenoid 1 are the external variables for this program. And I already declared them in the IO map. The, all the input elements are being connected to the input card. And the final control element is being connected to the output card. I shall now take a look at the program again. And I will go through the internal variables with you. R1 is used to control the solenoid and it is of boolean data type. Boolean means it will turn on or off. CTR1 is of a counter type which is called CTU. It's an up counter. This is a function available inside the PLC program. Okay, it's just a function block I'm using. CTR1 display is of integer type and it will display the current value count okay, of this counter. R2 is of boolean type. Okay, so the purpose of R2 is to reset the counter. And the two conditions to reset the counter is the CTR1.Q, which is the preset count, which is 5 here, and pressing the reset button PB2. Now let's watch the simulation. So as I told you earlier, I do not have the physical hardware with me. I'm using software simulation to show you how this program works. So I will toggle the context of the buttons and the sensors later on to show you this simulation. So now I'm going to turn on PB1 momentarily. So PB1 is now turned on and R1 is on. 
which means that the cycle has started. You can see that R1 is kept on because of this latching circuit. And R1 is being used to control the solenoid, okay, which means that I'm controlling the hopper door. So now the hopper door is open, okay, and pills will begin dropping into the bottle. So the pills are being sensed by this sensor called PS1. So when one pill drops inside the bottle, the sensor will sense, okay, and you can see that the count value now is 1, okay, which indicates that one pill has dropped inside the bottle. So now another pill will drop inside the bottle, okay, count value of 2. And take note, because of simulation purpose, I set my preset count to 5 only. So you can see that whenever a pill drops inside, you will, the counter will count up, okay. So now the last pill is going to drop inside and the count value will reach 5, okay. You can see that now the counter value has reached 5, okay, and the output turns on. The contact will become open, okay, and you can see that the contact open will become close and now the counter value has reached 5 okay so the solenoid is now off okay because R1 is off okay so the door is now closed no more pills can drop inside the bottle so how do I reset this counter to reset this counter R2 must turn on and what are the conditions for R2 to turn on the count value must have reached 5, which it has already reached. And somebody must press the reset button PB2. So, let me press the reset button. Okay, you can see that the counter immediately resets back to 0. And the output of the counter will go back to its original position, which is closed now. And this is open. So, to start this filling cycle again, I need to press PB1. Okay, and the hopper door is now open because solenoid has been energized. So the pills can continue to drop inside the bottle again. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to fast forward, okay. And by the time I reach the count of 5, okay, the contact normally close will become open and R1 is off. Okay, when R1 is off, the solenoid is off and the door is closed, okay. Now, no more pills can go inside this bottle. And how do I reset the counter? Well, first, as I told you earlier, the count value must reach. Okay, so now the count value has reached. Normally open has become closed. Okay, as you can see over here, I just need to press my reset button. Okay, you can see that R2 is now on. Okay, and the counter is immediately reset. Okay, so this is how this program works. I'm going to stop the simulation now. So we will now go back to the example 6. We will now go through the last example in our worksheet, which is example 6. So as you can see in figure 9a, we are showing you a automatic test station for SOFAS. And the sofa is subjected to the oscillating motion of this pneumatic double acting cylinder to test its durability. So figure 9b shows the pneumatic drive circuit where you can see that a single solenoid directional control valve is being used to control this double acting cylinder to make it extend and retract. So let's take a look at the operating sequence. So when an auto start PB1 is actuated, continuous cycle operation will commence. So in each operating cycle, the cylinder extends from its initial retracted position at LS1 and then stays at the fully extended position LS2 for 2 seconds okay, to exert stress on the sofa. As soon as the time delay expires, the cylinder will retract to its initial position. The cycle then repeats and this continuous cycle will come to a halt when stop PB is pressed or we call it PB2 over here and the counter CTR1 reaches the count of 200. So whenever the preset count is reached, an indicator light will switch on. Upon actuating a counter reset push button PB3, the counter will reset and the light bulb will turn off. So this is the operating sequence of this automatic test station for SOFA. 
This control circuit will be implemented by an Omron NJ101 PLC controller. And first, we will assign the I.O. variables in the global variable declaration table. Okay, I.O. means input, output. So let's take a look at what are the input and output elements over here. You can see that push button is an input. RS1 is also an input. RS2 is also an input. PB2 is also an input. PB3 is also an input. So these are the five input elements we are going to declare inside the global variable table. As for the final control output elements, I can see that light bulb is the output and solenoid one is a final control element which we will wire to the output card as well. So in the global variable declaration table, we will have light bulb and solenoid as the variables being connected to the output card. So you can see over here, I've already declared okay, the I.O. devices whereby PB1, PB2, LS1, LS2, PB3 is connected to the input and LB1 and solenoid1, SOL1 is connected to the output. I will then draw the wiring diagram okay, based on the global variable declaration table where I connected negative of the power supply to COM because in our lab, all the sensors we are having is a PMP sensor. Hence, we always configure our PLC input card to be a syncing type. Hence, we connected negative of the power supply to the COM input card of the PLC. Even though this question does not involve sensor, but it is our habit to always connect negative to COM to configure it as a syncing type input card. Hence, you can see that I connected negative to the COM, positive to all the devices. And you can see that LS1 is a normally open, held, close, activated position. Why? Because if you take a look at the pneumatic drive circuit over in figure 9b, LS1 is activated. Hence, we draw it normally open, held, close. And LS2 is not activated. So we draw it as normally open as you can see over here and for the output we connected the light bulb and the solenoid to the output card so this is how we connect our wiring diagram if you realize I did not declare counter or timers into this global variable decoration table for IO why because the counter and the timer is a software function in our PLC. They are not input-output devices. Okay, so it's just a software function. Hence, those things that I have declared over here, okay, in the global variable declaration table, is actually the physical elements, okay? The physical devices for instance we are connecting a push button to all the input cards the limit switch okay and the light bulb solenoid to the output card with this okay i will go and design a plc program in ladder to achieve the operating sequence so i will go on to the next page now Where you can see that I have already copied the operating sequence of this case study into this page so that I do not need to scroll up and down when I'm designing the PLC program in ladder. So I'll just refer to this operating sequence over here and draw the PLC program in ladder to show you how am I going to design my answers to achieve this sequence. Let's read the operating sequence sentence by sentence and then we will design the PLC program accordingly. So according to the first sentence, it mentioned that when an auto start push button PB1 is actuated, continuous cycle operation will commence. So I will design the PLC program such that I have a relay. I call it R1 and the purpose is to achieve continuous cycle 
or I call it auto cycle. So I will draw a latching circuit because I want R1 to stay on, okay, for the continuous cycle. So who will turn on R1? Well, PB1 will turn on R1. So I will fill in PB1 above the latching circuit over here. So PB1 will be a normally open contact so that when you press PB1, the contact will become closed and R1 will turn on and it will stay on because of the latching circuit. So who will turn off the continuous cycle? Well, the first sentence did not mention, so I'll leave it blank for now and I will continue to read the operating sequence until later on, I will then fill in the blanks when I come to the end of the operating sequence. So let's read the second bulletin. Initial operating cycle, the cylinder extends from its initial position at LS1 and then stays at its fully extended position at LS2 for 2 seconds. As soon as the time delay expires, the cylinder will then retract. So this sounds like a lot of actions are going on. So let's break down this operating sequence step by step so that we can design the PLC program easily. So the question mentions that when you press PV1 and the cylinder is at retracted position, the cylinder will then extend. So how do you know it's fully extended? You will reach LS2 and you'll stay there for two seconds. Okay. And after the time delay has expired, the cylinder will then retract and it will go to its retracted position at LS1 and this cycle will keep on repeating. So looking at this operating sequence over here, there are two actions I need to achieve, the cylinder extension and the cylinder retraction. So let's do the cylinder extension first. And as you can see, to make the cylinder extend, the cylinder must be at retracted position first and also somebody must have pressed PB1. So I will design a relay, I call it R2, and the purpose is to make the cylinder extend. So what are the conditions to make the cylinder extend? As I have told you, first, somebody must press PB1. Okay, how do you know that someone has pressed PB1? Well, R1 will know because R1 will turn on when someone has pressed PB1. So I will use R1 over here. And the cylinder must be at retracted position. So I will draw LS1 as well. And it will be normally open so that when it is activated, it will become closed. One thing I want to highlight about limit switches over here in PLC programming is we will always draw the non-activated positions in PLC program. Okay. So that's why you can see that LS1, okay. Is drawn as normally open. So I have already achieved extension over here. So the moment R2 turns on, the cylinder will extend. Now let's take a look at retraction. So who will make the cylinder retract? Well, look at the arrow before it, which is the timer. So I will need a timer over here. And it's a software timer available in the PLC program. It's an on timer. Inside there is four operands in preset time, Q and elapsed time. And I named the timer TR1. So who will trigger the timer? As you can see from this operating sequence, RS2 will turn on the timer. So I will draw RS2 as normally open so that when it's activated, it become closed and the timer will be activated. I know that TR1, the preset time is 2 seconds, so I write over here T hashtag 2S. For the elapsed time, I will just call it a name and I will use standard naming convention. I call it TR1 display. You can also use any names you like. Okay. So the purpose of this timer is to make the cylinder retract. Now, I want to make the cylinder extend and retract. And I realized that just now when I was reading the question, the directional control valve use for this case study is actually a single solenoid directional control valve. So let's take a look at the pneumatic drive circuit to confirm again. Okay, as you can see in figure 9b, we are using a single solenoid directional control valve. 
So for single solenoid directional control valve, we need to have a latching circuit so as to energize the solenoid continuously so that the cylinder can extend. So I will now design a relay. I call it R3. Okay. The purpose is to control the solenoid to make the cylinder extend and retract. Okay. So the purpose is actually to control the solenoid. And it's a single solenoid. So as I told you earlier, it has to be a latching circuit. Why? Because to make the cylinder extend, okay, I need to continuously turn on R3. And in order to continuously turn on R3, I need a latching circuit. So who will make the cylinder extend? I can see from my program R2 will make the cylinder extend. So I will fill in R2 on top of this latch. So we can see that when R2 turns on, R3 will be on and it will stay on because of the latch and the cylinder will stay extended. Okay? Because the solenoid is constantly energized. So when do you want the solenoid to be off? Okay, which means that you want to turn off R3. Well, when you want to make the cylinder retract. So what is the condition to make the cylinder retract? When the time delay has reached 2 seconds. Okay, so we have already created a timer over here. So this timer will turn on. Okay, the TR1.Q will turn on when the time has reached 2 seconds. So I will draw over here. A normally close contact of this timer tr1 dot q so dot q is the output of this timer so when two seconds has reached normally close of this timer will become open okay because the output will change okay and r3 will be off the solenoid will be off the cylinder will then retract so let's draw the control to the solenoid so r3 is used to control the single solenoid which is why we design R3 the purpose is to control the single solenoid to make the cylinder extend and retract okay so we have already achieved the sequence or the PLC program to achieve this sequence such that the cylinder will extend and retract now let's read this operating sequence where it states that the continuous cycle operation will come to a halt when any of the following conditions occur. When a stop PB is pressed, PB2, and the counter has reached the count of 200. So let's do the easier one first, which is the push button PB2. So earlier on, I already designed the continuous cycle relay. So to off this continuous cycle relay, one of the conditions is PB2. So I will draw PB2 normally close here. So that when it's activated, PB2 will become open and R1 will be off, which means that the continuous cycle is off. Okay. Another condition to make the continuous cycle come to a stop, okay, is when a count value reaches 200. So how do I know the count value has reached 200? First, I have to design a counter, right? And the output of the counter, when it reaches 200, it will be change so I will draw a normally close contact of this counter I call it ctr1.q so later on I will draw a counter ctr1 and dot q is the output of this counter so when the count value has reached 200 normally close will become open and r1 will be off so now let's proceed to design the counter first So I will draw over here in red this counter. So this counter is called CTR1. Okay. And it is a CTU type counter, which means count up counter. Inside this count counter, we have the CU, which is the count up, the R, the preset value, the Q. 
and the current value. So who will trigger this counter? Okay, so let's read again. So the counter is supposed to count the operating cycle, which means that the cylinder extend and retract is counted as one operating cycle. So can we use this timer to trigger the counter? Yes, we can, because every time the time has elapsed, okay, the cylinder will retract, okay, which means that I've already achieved one cycle. So I will use the timer. So when you reach the count of two seconds, okay, TR1.Q normally open will become closed and the counter will count once. Okay, and the preset value of this count is 200, as they mentioned over here. For current value, I'll just call it a name and I call it CTR1 display. Okay, and I have already used the output of this counter, which is CTR1.Q and hence when the counter has reached the value of 200, normally close contact of this counter will become open and it will break the auto cycle or the continuous cycle. So the continuous cycle will come to a stop. Okay, so now I have not filled in for the reset of this counter because I have not come to this particular sequence yet. So now let's read this. When the preset count is reached, an indicator light bulb will switch on. Upon actuating a counter reset button PB3, the counter will then be reset. So can I say that the conditions to make the counter reset is when the count value is reached and you press PB3. So let's design a relay. Okay, I call it R4 now. And the purpose is to reset the counter. So the two conditions they mention is when a count value is reached. So I'll draw a normally open contact so that when the count value of CTR1 is reached, normally open will become close okay and r4 will turn on provided somebody press pb3 okay so i will draw pb3 normally open contact here as well so let's recap again to reset this counter i need to have the preset count reach that's why i draw ctr1.q normally open so that when preset count is reach this counter output will be closed okay normally open will become closed and also provided somebody has pressed pb3 r4 will then turn on so r4 is used to reset the counter okay so with this let's draw the last thing which is i need to make the light bulb switch on when the preset count is reached so I will draw the light bulb over here, LB1. And when the preset count is reached, which is CTR1.Q, normally open and it will become closed. Okay, when the preset count is reached, light bulb will be on. So we have finished designing the PLC program to achieve this operating sequence. So to recap, in PLC ladder programming, we will only use normally open, normally close contact, the coil, the timer and counter for now in your programming design. You can see that the solenoid when we draw in the PLC program is just a coil. Same thing for the light bulb as well. And for the push button and other input elements, we will only use normally open or normally close. Okay, as you can see over here. So to summarize, you have learned about PLC ladder programming. You learn about how to use the timer and how to use the counter. And with this knowledge, we will go on to PLC chapter three later on. So for now, we have finished PLC chapter two. 
and we have learned the basic ladder instructions and we learn how to apply them to achieve the control that we want.